Good morning and welcome to our online service. Uh, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. We keep echoing those words as we move, first of all, through Easter. Secondly, week by week, further away from the events of the resurrection. And we do them for a few reasons to remind ourselves of the season that we're in, to keep our thoughts and our prayers and our entire theology focused truly on the resurrected Christ, even as the world continues to turn, even as things are happening in the world at large and perhaps in our own communities and in our own lives that might at times take our focus away from the reality of the resurrected Christ. Now, that reality is probably the most important thing in today's reading. Last week, we had a, a resurrection story from the Gospel of John about the disciples locked in an upper room, afraid of the Jews, Jesus appearing among them and saying, peace be with you, peace be with you, peace be with you three times, then uh, bestowing his spirit upon them, saying to them, by the power of the spirit in me, you will now forgive each other, forgive others. By doing that, you are continuing, continuing my work in the world. You are continuing indeed the father's work that I began in the world. Now, the danger today is that because we just had that story last week, we might fall into the trap of familiarity with today's story. Because, it, because in certain ways, it's similar, but it's from the Gospel of Luke, not John. And although we might say a word or two about the similarities, we certainly will also say a word or two about the differences. But moreover, more importantly than that, we will examine the story in its own right, and as we've been doing, as we move through Easter, instead of uh, preaching or trying to make a point out of the story, we'll simply tell it and let the story be its own witness. Because witnesses is ultimately what we are called to be, as we'll see from our text. Luke chapter 24, this is almost the very, very end of Luke, verses 36 to 48. This happens right after the events of the two men who meet Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Uh, but that's not our reading. Our reading happens when they had broken bread with Jesus and they'd come to realize that it was him. And they rush back to Jerusalem, these two men from Emmaus, to go tell the other disciples. While they were recounting these events, verse, uh, 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 verse 36, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. There we have again the peace that John also told us about. They were startled and frightened, quite the way that the disciples were in the book of John, thinking that they saw a ghost. But he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate in their presence. That seems to be crucial to Luke's understanding of these events, is that the disciples saw him and touched him but when he ate with them, they became fully, well, not perhaps all of them, as the text doesn't say that they all believed, but the act of eating with them seemed to cement for the disciples the reality that Christ was not some kind of ghost or appearance, but truly resurrected in body with them. Verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, to send you uh, a my mistake, beginning at Jerusalem, full stop, verse 48. You are witnesses of these things. 
I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. I just realized that last verse 49 is not part of our reading. We end on the very concise yet powerful verse 48. You are witnesses of these things, but I couldn't help myself. So Luke recounts, like we said, quite the same story of, uh, as John. The disciples are in a place of confusion and, and bewilderment. Jesus appears out of thin air, says, peace be with you. That doesn't seem to bring them any peace at all. In fact, then they are really bewildered and amazed. But he shows them that he is not some kind of ghost or some phantasmic uh, uh, manifestation, but it is him. It is truly the Christ who walked and lived with them for three years. This is the funny thing about the resurrection. Jesus rises from the grave. Jesus comes back from beyond the dead to proclaim victory. But the victorious Christ carries the marks of the crucifixion on his body. He does not, in that sense, come back to his disciples with a fully healed body, without scars and without wounds. And, and, and there's something unbelievably comforting in the thought that even now, as Christ sits at the right hand of the Father and petitions on our behalf, even now he has the wounds of the crucifixion upon his body because it is the wounds of the crucifixion that won for us eternal life and relationship with Christ. So Jesus says to them, I'm not a ghost. Do not doubt, but believe. Come, look, see, touch, feel for yourselves. And they do. And some believe, but some don't believe. And Jesus says, I'm hungry. Now, how can a ghost be hungry? I'm hungry, says Jesus. Give me something to eat. And so they have some fish prepared. And he sits with them and he eats with them. He chews and he swallows and he digests. And then, as Jesus often, often does in the book of Luke, around the table, breaking bread, sharing a meal, he begins to tell them, this is everything that I told you was going to happen. He doesn't chastise or punish the disciples that they had not realized it sooner, that they had not by some kind of human intellectual reckoning come to the conclusion that all these things around his crucifixion and resurrection, he told them was going to happen so that they may understand it when they read the Old Testament, uh, the law and the prophets and the Psalms. It is by his intervention and his involvement that they gain that understanding. And there's a lesson in there as well for the modern church that we mustn't think because we have all the knowledge about the Bible that we understand the Bible. What understanding we have, I might add, what little understanding we have, we have because it has been revealed to us by Christ through the Spirit. And he takes them through the same process. And by that, by that interventionary power, he shows them, he opens their minds to understanding how Scripture has always spoken about him and about his work. But now, and here's the second lesson for the church, that revelation is given to the disciples. There's nothing in there about that same revelation simply being given to the readers because they've read it. I think there's a bit more legwork to be done, but that legwork reaches us when we go into the season of Pentecost. And that's not the point of today's message. Luke gives us a preview of what is going to happen in the book of Acts. Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and the book, the Acts of the Apostles, written by the same man, by Luke, you have to read them and regard them as a unit. The gospel being part one and the acts being part two. And in these last verses, Jesus, well, I should say, through the words of Jesus, Luke is setting up everything that is going to happen in the book of Acts. And that's why the following verse is incredibly important in understanding what happens next when the disciples go out into the world. It is uh, verse 46 as well as 47. This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. 
and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Last week we had much the same sentiment. Jesus saying, as the Father sent me, I now send you to do what? To forgive the sins of others. Here Jesus is saying, in light of the revelation of the entirety of Scripture, the Messiah is crucified and rises from the grave so that forgiveness and repentance may be proclaimed to all nations. We must understand that John, in all likelihood, wrote to an isolated and insulated Jewish community, a small community, but Luke writes to the world. Luke's entire uh, reason and purpose behind writing the Gospel and the Acts of the Apostles is so that all nations and all peoples, not just the Jews, may know that in the ministry and the death and resurrection of Christ, they have access to God. That's incredibly important to understanding the Gospel of Luke, is that Luke writes primarily not for people in Jerusalem who are Jewish and who know the Old Testament, but he writes for Gentiles. And ultimately, that's what we are. We are those who have been reached through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years through the proclamation of repentance and forgiveness of sins to all nations, to Gentile peoples. That is why we also have access to the same gospel even here and now in North Lakes in 2021. Then the last verse, you are witnesses of these things. Now I've said this a few times before and I continue repeating it because I find it very important in my own understanding of faith and of the mission of the church. And I find it in some respects lacking in the actual practice of the church, whether that be the church here in Australia or anywhere else in the world where I've had the privilege or the, uh, the opportunity to be a witness of or an, or an observer of. Our job is not to convince the world of the gospel. Our job is to be witnesses to the gospel. We are not in the first instance called to be apologists explaining and apologizing and defending the faith. We are called to be witnesses of the gospel. A witness is not called into a court of law and asked to defend or explain whatever he has witnessed or observed or been party to. He or she is called to recount the events as best and as truthfully as he or she can. Now we can make a hundred sermons about how to truly and truthfully be witnesses to Christ. But first of all, we must become witnesses. We must become those who witness not just by our words, but by our lives of the life-changing power and revelation of the gospel itself. And too often we get caught in the struggle of trying to convince people that we're right. The church wasn't convinced people that we're right. We must simply live as if Christ is resurrected Lord of all. And sometimes I need to ask myself, when, when that tendency to explain or to convince or to defend overwhelms me, whether I'm doing it to save my own skin, whether I'm doing it to prove my own cleverness, whether I really think God needs defending, whether I've really perhaps drifted from my true mission, my true calling, which is simply to say uh, uh, that, that the gospel the Old Testament, the New Testament, the revelation of, and the story of God with his people, that that is a story that has changed my life. That that is a story that promises the changing of the world. 
it takes a significant weight off our shoulders. When we, when we stop trying to defend our faith or defend the Bible or defend the church and simply start being witnesses who have nothing to prove, but we have a story to tell, who have nothing to defend, but we have our lives to relate in light of the events of the gospel. The word Luke uses that we translate as witness in the New Testament, the Greek word is marturia. Martyr is the more common English translation of the original Greek word. Now, of course, when someone says that they're a martyr, we don't imagine the first thing that they are being a witness. We think the two are quite, sim uh, quite, quite, quite different. A martyr is, of course, in most cases, someone who dies for their conviction. More often than not, for their religious conviction. And so we'll talk about the martyrs of the early church or the martyrs of the persecution under the Roman Empire. But the word itself must not lead us onto a path of thinking that we should all be martyrs who die for our faith. The word marturia should lead us to recognizing that witnessing is risky business in the first place. Whether you face persecution or mockery or death or simply apathy. There is a, there's an Armenian proverb which goes something like, he who speaks the truth must have one foot in the stirrup of a, of a horse's saddle. The idea being that if you are brave enough to speak the truth, if you are brave enough to be a truthful witness, you also have to be quick enough to get on your horse and get out of town before you're caught and punished for your, for your bravery or perhaps for your truthful foolishness or your foolish truth-telling, whichever suits you best. I quite think the Christian version of that proverb would go something like, he who is brave enough to speak the truth, she who is speaking the truth is also being led to the cross. That's the point that, that, that Paul will certainly make if we paraphrase, is that when you become a witness, a martyr, to the truth of the gospel, to the reality of the risen Christ, you take on the risk that all previous witnesses and martyrs have taken on. There's no way around it. This doesn't happen when you defend the faith. This happens when you are a witness to the gospel. The funny thing about the gospel, the funny thing about truth in general, is that truth does not become less true because less people believe it. Truth is what it is, and the gospel is what it is. It's quite like having a measure of gold. Gold does not stop being gold because its value changes. It is what it is. And you can't put it in the bank and come back in two years and then you have more gold. Its value might have gone up or gone down. And you can't take truth and put it and proclaim it in the church and then somehow hope it becomes more true. It is what it is. You can't take the gospel and try your best to defend it according to your human abilities and somehow make it more gospelly. It is what it is. And we are simply called to be witnesses. Now what happens at Pentecost is different. That progresses the story. That takes us from being witnesses without the power of the Spirit at this point to being apostles with those first apostles who receive the power of the Spirit and then go out into the world. But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. For now, even before receiving the power of the Spirit in this telling, in Luke's telling of the story, he says to them, you are witnesses to all these things. You've seen it. You've heard it. In their case, they felt it and touched the resurrected Christ. You now know how the Old and the New Testament 
tell about all the events of Easter. Now go tell the world. There's something we need to confess in church that we spend an awful lot of time trying to convince people that we're right. And if we took all that time and all that energy and all those resources away from the people who spend so much time trying to convince the world that they're right, and we put it towards witnessing to the love and the grace and the compassion and the conviction of Christ who died for our sins and rose so that we may have the open path of repentance and access to the kingdom of God lying before us. If we do that, then we're taking the gospel seriously. Now perhaps... I started by saying that there won't be so much of a sermon as a telling of the story and it kind of turned itself into a sermon. But maybe maybe we should end here. Before we fall into the trap of trying to explain the whole story or defend the whole story, let's go out and be the story. Let's tell the story. Let's witness with our mouths and with our hands and our feet and our hearts to everything that the gospel tells about our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God our Father, and the power of the Spirit be with each and every one of us. Amen.